So uh, we are, as well are an independent company. Double Line is owned 20% by Oak Tree, who's uh, a few floors above where we are right now, but 80% by partners of the firm. And so we have about 300 employees, but it's highly an investment focus. For a firm of our makeup, which is uh, more than 50% of our assets are on the open and mutual fund platforms, we have almost nothing in the way of wholesalers. Most large mutual fund companies would have 100 at least. I pejoratively call wholesalers donut buyers. They go out and buy donuts in you know, secondary cities across the country. That's why you need so many of them. I think we have four wholesalers, which is almost, as, almost the same as having zero. So I'm going to talk today about where we stand uh, with some market opportunities and risks. And I always try to begin, when I think about asset allocation and investments, I always like to start with the state of the economy. And uh, more specifically, what do we do? Can we, can we squint our eyes and, and pretend that we can see a recession on the horizon? If so, then we have to calibrate our risk appropriately. But if not, then you are in a really good spot. Now, two years ago, there was a viewpoint that there was a global, synchronized global expansion that was right back at the very end of January 2018. And it was true for the moment. However, what's interesting is the global stock market will see this peaked, if we just take the Morgan Stanley uh, global composite, it peaked January 26th of 2018, exactly the day when synchronized global expansion was very much in the news. And interestingly, that came back in the news. I got a few memos in the last week, people talking about the synchronized global expansion, but it's nothing like it was uh, late 17 into uh, 2018. But the one thing about a narrative of synchronized global expansion that's true is it's not good for markets. Because what's obvious, and it's obvious to everybody when that's a consensus point of view, synchronized global expansion, what's obvious is obviously priced in. And indeed, that was the case. So let's take a look at some of the things that we like to think about in terms of, first, the global economy. Global economy, you can see the red line 2018 and uh, the 2017 line, I guess that's kind of black or something or dark, dark brown. You can see how those were unusual years where the economists were upgrading their outlook for the ultimate world GDP in, uh, th throughout the year 2017 for that year, and then throughout 2017 into the first part of 2018. And they held up. They held up to two very good years. And then uh, 2019 was the opposite. Lots of downgrades. Isn't it strange that during the year when the economy held in there, the red line, 2018, isn't it weird that that was the negative year? And 2019, the year that you had nonstop downgrades, you know, from about um, high threes, where people's guesses started, down to what it looks like it's going to be for the year, about 3%, a big downgrade. So there's a lot of belief that the economy and the stock market are uh, closely related, but I think the stock market is goes first. It's a leading indicator, and that's why it's in the conference board's leading economic indicators is one of the, one of the things. So th th we are now we're looking at 2020. Uh, pretty much everybody has the same guess in both the U.S. economy and the global economy that 2020 is going to be a lot like 2019 in terms of, of real GDP growth. Uh, uh, last year was a decline in bond yields. This says 12 months change, so it's actually not f for the calendar year 2019. It's for the last 12 months, literally through the January 27th. We had uh, bond yields decline all over the place, in particular in Turkey, where there was a huge decline, but they started at a very high rate. Um, I, that's, pretty much, uh, that's pretty much carried through. Uh, Turkey's down already in yields by about 200 basis points this year. Uh, and thanks to uh, the falling commodity prices and the coronavirus, uh, you, you, we now have lower interest rates also this year in pretty much every country, not as robust as last year. One of the things that these falling interest rates have done, is they created the strange situation with negative yielding bonds. The red line on here is uh, negative yielding debt market value uh, in total, uh, no, just corporate bonds, and then the blue line is in total. So the blue line is at the, is at the big scale, 
and the red line is at the smaller scale over on the right-hand side. But it's interesting that we went all the way up to nearly $18 trillion of negative yielding bonds in the developed world, primarily. And then the red line, what's really amazing, is corporate <laughs> bonds, corporations in Europe, to the tune of, at one point, $1.2 trillion, but now half of that amount are able to borrow at negative yields. You wonder why they don't borrow in an infinite amount at negative yields. It seems like it would be a wonderful way of increasing your profitability. Uh, but the, we had rates hit their low in the middle of 2019, around August or September, and that's when we had the high point of negative yielding debt. And then we have uh, uh, had something of a little rise in interest rates that is now being at least partially in, in many parts of the world more than slightly partially reversed. So it's negative yielding bonds again. One thing that is not uh, really a, a good sign is that negative yielding bonds have shown to correlate very highly with trouble in the local area's banking system that has gone negative on their central policy rates. For example, um, I, don't, I don't think I included the chart in here. I, I, may, run, I may run into it. Yeah. Well, this is close enough. Let's, let's look at this, global banking stocks. This is Japan uh, down at the bottom, that purpley line, and then we've got Euro stocks, bank stocks, is the red line, we've got the blue, which is U.S. bank stocks, the KBW bank index. And we start them all off back in the mid-90s at the same level, uh, unitizing it there. So you can see something really interesting happened into the global financial crisis. You see that the, that the J Japanese banking price, the topics, banks and index, went down. While the red line, Europe, and the blue line, the United States, went up 350, 400 percent. Why is that? Why could Japan not participate in the banking boom that led to the global financial crisis? Well, that's because they had negative interest rates, and they've been there a long time, because negative interest rates are fatal, ultimately, to your banking system. You can see what happened in the global financial crisis. Both the U.S. and Europe banks dropped exactly the same amount, almost to the basis point. And then something weird happened in the, in the 2010s, and that is the European bank index couldn't get out of its own way, and the U.S. bank index, the KBW, went all the way back up to its high, basically, of 2007. Why is that? Why this massive divergence between Europe and the United States? Negative interest rates. So thank goodness the U.S. is not contemplating, at least in the words of Jay Powell, negative interest rates, because I really think that if the U.S pivoted and did start to move towards negative interest rates, the global financial system would collapse because there would be nowhere to avoid this capital destruction that is so evident in the scenarios of Japan and uh, Europe taking us negative interest rates. There's, the United States markets are so big that they're able to uh, absorb capital from around the world. If we went negative too, where would capital go? I think the whole banking industry would be in shambles. I think Jay Powell understands that, at least he's said the right things. Um, I applaud him for that. I've been critical of his inconsistency, which, thanks to the market cooperating in the last several months, his inconsistency has kind of faded away because there has been no dichotomy of message any longer between what the bond market is saying, which in the summer was, you better start easing right away, and the Fed's rhetoric, which early in 2019 had been, we're going to do sequential interest rate increases and quantitative tightening kind of nonstop until we get to $3.5 trillion on the balance sheet, which they, which they never really got to. So uh, I applaud no negative interest rates in the U.S. However, as investors, I think what we are also hearing is that Jay Powell intends on using large-scale asset purchases, i.e. quantitative easing part four, and not the repo thing that they've been tinkering around with, but the real deal where they buy long-term bonds and they help to fund the budget deficit. Just to uh, zoom in a little bit on Europe, this is Deutsche Bank stock, which I follow pretty closely, because they've got so many bad loans that aren't being recognized as bad loans that it's quite likely that on a real liquidation basis, the Deutsche Bank is bankrupt. Uh, and you see that in the, in the uh, long decline. And this is just going back to 2017. This, this stock has been terrible for 25 years, nearly. And you'll notice that it started to rally up, up until the last day of this exhibit, which was, I think, January uh, 28th, so we're right up to date except for today. And you notice it's been rallying um, by a fair percentage amount. It's only a couple of points. 
on the right-hand scale. That's a fair percentage amount. So if, right now, if interest rates are not rising around the world. They've started falling again in the last few months. Um, so that's going to be a problem for Deutsche Bank. If you want to bet on higher 10-year interest rates around the world, probably one of the best, easiest ways to profit on that is to buy Deutsche Bank stock because it goes up a huge amount. It's incredibly leveraged to the, the scenario of positive interest rates should it ever occur. German 10-year uh, had a low yield of negative 70 basis points um, in 2019. That's the lowest it's ever been. And it made it all the way back to negative 15 basis points um, a, few, a few several weeks ago. And now it's down to negative 38 again. So Deutsche Bank should be weakening, but um, it hasn't uh, really caught up to that reality. This is interesting. It's not just the regions of the world. We looked at Japan, Europe, United States, and saw the diversion of their banking indices. This is just comparing the S&P financial sector to the S&P 500, and we can take it back to pre-financial crisis right at the top of the 07 market. And we can see that we had both financials, that's the red line, and the S&P 500 fall pretty mightily. The financials dropped about 80 percent, it looks like, and the um, S&P dropped about 50 percent. Since then, it's been a huge ride up on quantitative easing and uh, financial engineering and tax cuts and a better U.S. economy for sure than it was at the late part of the OOs. And we see that we've had a hundred uh, thirty, a, uh, now all the way up to a 133 percent return. And what the banking sector has made it only back to the 07 high. So low interest rates and financial suppression and all that by the Fed has obviously led to a underperformance that's pretty mighty by the banks versus the uh, S&P 500 broadly. I have to laugh when I, the few times anymore that I have the sound on for CNBC and, and like programs, is they always say, what's your favorite trade for tomorrow morning type of thing? And invariably, somebody wants to buy the banks. This has been going on for years and years and years. They're, they want to buy the banks. I guess they think they're cheap. And I guess they are on a relative basis when you look at this performance. But they just can't seem to ever outperform. Um, so I, I think we would need a totally different interest rate regime one of you know, interest rates that were non-trivial, that were above the inflation rate, which is exactly the opposite of the desired policy of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve, clearly, with their talk about wanting inflation to go above 2% and stay there, basically, clearly they want interest rates to be lower than the inflation rate and lower than nominal GDP, which is understandable given the debt compounding problem that the developed world, the United States, more than any part of the world at this point, is, uh, is faced with, it slows down the debt compounding problem. Because as you all know, we have over $23 trillion of national debt and nearly $130 trillion of unfunded liabilities across the United States, 600 percent of GDP of unfunded liabilities. So we could either pay them, which one way to think about 600 percent of GDP is we would have to take 10% out of GDP for 60 years to fund these liabilities, which would cause a two-generation mega depression. So we can't do that. So we either have to partially default, like raise the Social Security age, cut pension benefits in Illinois and things like that, or else we need to inflate them away. At least by having interest rates being lower than the inflation rate, you're doing a little bit of inflating away. And the government borrows a huge amount of its debt at the short end. T-bills represent about 75 percent of all the debt that's issued, and the, the Fed has conveniently been buying those T-bills minutes or hours after they're issued, so if they're not technically buying them in a monetization form, they're buying them in the secondary market, but it's just a charade. Uh, they're in that way. It's not surprising that President Trump is beating the drum loudly for zero or negative interest rates, which sure help the interest expense problem that faces the United States. Right now, about one and a quarter percent of GDP goes to interest payments. The CBO, without assuming in a recession at any time, or uh, largely different interest rates than we are now, have a study that shows that by 20, uh, 27 or so, so seven short years from now, about three and a quarter percent of GDP would go to interest payments. When you think about that, that, was, that creates an enormous headwind for real GDP if 2% of your GDP incrementally is going, is going to uh, interest expense. I showed the world uh, interest rate forecasts, uh, sorry, growth forecasts, real GDP. U.S. looks kind of the same. 
you know, President Trump is kind of comical how he talks about this is the greatest economy in the history of the world. I think he said history of the universe this week. Um, <laughs> But I don't know, it's not even the, the best growth in the history of his administration. I mean, 2018 was solidly a percentage point above what the forecast is for 2020. So the economy seems to have slowed down a little bit. A lot of that's due to manufacturing, um, for sure, which we'll look at in a moment. But you never get a recession. When we talk about how do we allocate capital, is there a recession coming? You have historically, these red shaded areas are the history of recessions. They're all the official declared recessions going back to 1960. And then we have the leading economic indicators year over year, that's the black line. And you'll sort of notice that you never get a recession without the leading indicators going negative before the front end of the recession hits. Sometimes you get a false positive. You did back in the late 60s, you got a couple false positives in the mid 90s. And we've had a couple since the global financial crisis, although you almost need a magnifying glass to tell if the black line is below that horizontal red dotted line. But uh, for that, right now, we're teetering on the edge. Uh, so this is in watch it and wait, let's wait and see mode. The year over year is now 0 0.1. There was a low number printed, just the one just out last week. And then we, for high frequency, to try to give us a sense of what the future might bring, we have the six month annualized, which is more volatile, of course, that's the red line, which is not giving much information. It's actually slightly negative. So not, not really, uh, can't really say a recession coming based on this indicator, but it's a lot weaker, obviously, than it was 18 months ago when it was running at 6.5% year over year. Um, the numbers that are coming off in the next three months are uh, trailing 0 0.4. So unless, if, if, unless we get 0 0.4, we are going to, cumulatively over the next three months, we are going to go negative on these leading indicators. So it's going to be worth watching. There are surveys of business people. One of them is by Market. That's not on the screen. This is by the ISM, um, Institute of Supply Management, Manufacturing, and then the services. So manufacturing is blue and services is red. And what you see is that manufacturing is the worst it's been since the global financial crisis. The blue line is steeply declining and has all the world the look of a recession. Again, these are the last two recessions. We see the red shaded areas. And it has exactly the look of a recession should be coming. But the efficacy of the manufacturing PMI has been declining over the years as the manufacturing share of the U.S. economy has shrunk mightily over the past 30 years. That's one of the reasons you have President Trump, is because we've hollowed out our manufacturing economy. And uh, so it's probably less of a tell. So I think for us to get really worried, we would need the blue line to be corroborated by the red line which is non-manufacturing, more of a services PMI, which was looking a little dire a few months back, but that's uh, stabilized. And the Fed, one of the reasons the Fed has gone on hold, I think, is A, the bond market message, and B, uh, inflation on some measures not being where they want it to be, and C, we have rebounded on the, the non-manufacturing PMI. So this bears watching. It comes out every month. No, not really a recession, recession sign here. Much is made of the strong consumer confidence, and it is very strong. This is the conference board's survey of consumer confidence in, what, what's your view of today? That's what this is asked, the question is asking. How are you feeling about where you are today? And they're feeling about as, as good as they have at any time in the last 45 years. That isn't exactly the best news in the world, because you notice they felt really good prior to the OO bust, and they felt pretty uh, locally okay prior to the global financial crisis. So again, it's not so much the level being reached at euphoria that's concerning, because it, it can last that way for years. It can last that way for four or five years back in the late 90s, for four or five years in the middle late 80s. And it's been going on here now for about three years. But again, what you have to worry about is when it starts falling. You'll notice it starts tanking you know, a few months before the front edge of recession. We have zero signal from consumer confidence. There's nothing to worry about from this slide in and of itself, unless it starts weakening. Now, one of the things that weakens consumer confidence, not surprisingly, is rising unemployment. And we don't have that either. I haven't really included much on that topic, but we all know that we're at a 50-year low. In, they've redefined the unemployment rate. It would be higher if we used 20 years ago standards, but it's still low by, uh, by uh, any kind of metric when you get to the present definition. Now, they also ask the question, at the Conference Board of Consumers, how do you feel about 12 months from now? And amazingly, while the consumers have held up so well 
for the past few years, their view of the future has been bad for a long time. In fact, this is the difference between the two. So what you have is when you have a big red shaded area, it means that the view of the future is much more dire than the view of today. And once you have a big green shaded area, it's usually after a recession because people feel lousy about today and they're starting to feel like maybe the future can be better because we've suffered through this bad economic environment. You notice all these recessions going back to 1975 that right before the recession hits, the front edge of the recession, the red shaded er area starts to shrink very rapidly. That's because the view of the present is collapsing, just like on the prior slide. So right now where we are is the view of the present is great, and the view of the future has been pretty bad now for two years, and it's actually about the level, worse than the level before the global financial crisis, and approximately the same level before the OO dot com bust. So we watch this very carefully because until we start to see the view of the present start to join the view of the future in a more cloudy, pessimistic outlook, until then, we can stay with the big red shaded area for years as the has been happening. So one of the most important indicators to be watching, I think, every month, and this just came out, is the difference between these two. It's certainly in the territory where one has to uh, be careful and watch it, but it's not giving a signal yet. Now here is unemployment. We've, we've, admittedly, we've kind of data mined this chart to almost, it's uncanny how the front edge of the recessions, the blue line crosses that smoother moving average line of the red line almost exactly at the front edge of the recessions. So it's an, an incredibly timely <coughs> indicator. Now what we have here is the, is the five year moving average of the four, month, four week moving average of the claims that are released every Thursday. Every Thursday, how many unemployment claims were there? And that's a very volatile number, so we don't like using the weekly. We like smoothing it a little with the blue line, which is four week average. And then the, uh, the, the, the red is the five year moving average. So we, we would be on watch here for sure if we crossed with the blue line above the five year moving average, and it's getting closer for sure. But the most recent points uh, have been volatile with year end and a very late holiday season. So we're going to watch this in the weeks ahead. The most recent data point was 213,000 against an average of 243. So we have a pretty big 30,000 cushion. So clearly no imminent recession sign here. Here's what uh, everybody wants to rise, I guess. At least the politicians certainly do, and I think the Fed does. U.S. average hourly earnings. We use a subset of the broad series. We, we think it's more predictive. We use um, non-supervisory. And again, uh, we see that we have been in a rising trend since the, uh, basically the uh, 2013 period where the low was 1.2. We had a really weird drop in the most recent data report. It went from 3.7 to 3.0. So a really big decline. It was really starting to look like a meaningful uptrend, but that got interrupted. So average hourly earnings are clearly running higher than, the, uh, in, by, than bond yields, clearly running higher than the broader measures of CPI and other consumer and producer costs. This is kind of a fun fact, uh, a little bit interesting. It's a, only a one data point sample, so I don't know if it's worth much of anything statistically. But what we're comparing here is the 30-year mortgage rate, the Freddie Mac 30-year mortgage rate in blue, with average hourly earnings, that same line from the preceding slide. And we just crossed over uh, re recently. It, it just backed off on the most recent data point. But the one before it, it had just crossed over where for a minute the uh, average hourly earnings were higher year over year than the mortgage rate. And that only, that's only happened once in the past 50 years. And that was way back in the 70s. And when you got the uh, average hourly earnings higher than the mortgage rate in that, uh, on the far left there, it wasn't a really good sign for the bond market because you went on a thousand basis point increase in mortgage rates over about a five year period. It seems highly unlikely that that's gonna happen in our environment today. Uh, also with the Fed standing ready to manipulate our long-term interest rates, almost uh, admitting it in plain English at their press conferences. Uh, so uh, just an interesting fact, it's just only happened once in the last 50 years. Another uh, measure of uh, wages, which corroborates average hourly earnings in an uptrend, is Employment Cost Index, which is a quarterly data series. You don't see much uh, attention being paid to this anymore, 
But it's interesting that it corroborates the upward move in, uh, in uh, average hourly earnings. And here's just measures of inflation. But basically, they're all kind of trending irregularly higher. Some of them are quite high. The Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland has a median CPI that's up at 2.9. Everything on here has a two handle, except for the one the Fed chooses to look at, which is U.S. Personal Consumption Expenditure Core, which is a bogus series. It uses uh, uh, Medicare reimbursements as the measure of health care inflation, which is intentionally understated. There's, a, there's tons of inflation in the healthcare system away from the growth in Medicare reimbursements. Those are, those are you know, kept low, and that's what is used here. Well, it's one of the reasons why the, the PCE deflator is persistently lower than CPI and some of these other measures. But these are all kind of, in, except for PCE deflator, they're all kind of in the, in the world that Jay Powell says he wants. He wants inflation to be substantially above 2%. Um, for a persistent period of time before he considered tightening, and he delivered that message again today. I'll skip that one. Um, the balance sheet of the Fed has been really important in driving markets. We see QE1, QE2, and QE3 as the blue line goes up. The left scale is the size of the Fed's balance sheet. It got to $4.5 trillion, and they kept it there for three years. And then they started QT in 2018 and managed to kill off the global synchronized uh, expansion narrative and weirdly, as we'll see in a minute, weirdly, when they, are, when, they are, uh, when they are buying bonds through QE, weirdly, uh, bond yields tend to rise. And when they, are buy, when they are putting bonds into the market through QT, weirdly, interest rates tend to fall. You think the opposite would be the case based on supply. You would think quantitative easing would be curtailing supply and quantitative tightening would be amplifying supply into the bond market. And that's certainly a fact. But the consequences of those actions seem to override the supply, and exactly the opposite happens. Also, some other things happen with the Fed's balance sheet. The yield curve follows the, the, the movement of the Fed's balance sheet. This is the yield difference. Um, the uh, red line is the diff yield that the 10-year Treasury has versus the three-month T-bill. So it's how much extra yield you get by, buying, by lending out 10 years rather than three months. And as the balance sheet was shrinking, we see that the yield curve was flattening, flattening, flattening. In fact, it inverted threes to tens, and it's, uh, it's very nearly inverted again today, thanks to a rally on the long end. And then you see the day that the Fed started its repo facility, that's when the black line started to expand. They don't call it QE, but it's still expanding their holdings. The yield curve started steepening immediately. And now the black line has stabilized for now. It'll start going up again. Um, a little later this year, then I'll winding down a little bit their repo facility and buying T-bills, uh, 60 billion per month. But what we see is the pattern continues again. Now that they've stopped expanding their balance sheet, weirdly, now the fuel curve is flattening again. So it's an incredibly high correlation between the Fed expanding its balance sheet and the yield curve uh, flattening, uh, sorry, steepening, and the, and the yield, and Fed decreasing its, its balance sheet and the yield curve flattens. So that's one way to think about how we might predict the future on that. Um, oh, this didn't work. Somehow this chart got to squished over to the right. But anyway, it, it, you'll have to trust me on this. It proves with, we go through QE1, QE2, QE3, tapering, the whole thing. In every single instance, when they're doing QE, rates fall. When they're expanding the balance sheet, rates fall. And when the balance sheet is, is shrinking, rates rise, and I know it's very counterintuitive, but there are no exceptions to that pattern, going back to the beginning of the quantitative easing regime under Bernanke. This is a line that was almost repeated today, but I think it's underappreciated. You would think that this would scare long-term part of the bond market, but it hasn't. Jay Powell, October 31st, he said, I think we would need to see a really significant, not just significant, really significant, move up in inflation that's persistent, which means lasts several months at a minimum, I would think, before we'd even consider raising rates to address inflation, inflation concerns. Well, they might raise rates for another reason, but they don't have any inflation concerns. Their inflation concerns are that it's too low. They want the inflation rate to be higher than the interest rate, and that's kind of your gateway drug to modern monetary theory. That's basically what modern monetary theory is, is that you want interest rates to be below the growth rate and below the uh, inflation rate. It's kind of a weird theory because the growth rate is looking backwards 
right? and the interest payments are looking forwards. So you have a, a time window mismatch, which could be really dangerous. You could borrow money at 1% while growth is 2%. But what happens if then growth goes to negative 5 for five years? So you have a problem that your debt is locked in for 10 years, for example, if it's a 10-year treasury, and yet your growth is, could be highly volatile over that 10-year time period. The U.S. budget deficit is no longer concerning hardly anybody, it seems, although I still think it's really a big problem as we move forward for the next seven years. Um, what we have here is the blue uh, dotted line is the unemployment rate, uh, and obviously it's very low. You can see it's a very, very low, low level. And uh, unemployment total labor force seasonally adjusted is 3.5, and that's on the left-hand scale. And then we've got the red area which is plotted inversely is the U.S. budget deficit, and that's not even the national debt, which is 50% bigger. The growth of national debt will probably be 1.5 trillion this year. The deficit will only be 1 trillion because they don't include a whole bunch of stuff like wars and national disaster relief and veterans benefits and stuff like this in, in, the, uh, defi in the deficit, it's the national debt. But you can see that where we are right now, at the, and this is just the deficit, the national debt growth is more like 6% of GDP, but just the deficit is 4.7% of GDP is, is the growth. Well, nominal GDP is running at about, well, it depends whose estimates you use, 3.8 to 4.4. So <laughs> the deficit is growing faster than nominal GDP, which is pretty incredible, because the national debt is at 23 and change. It's higher than GDP. So if they're both ra rising at the same percentage rate, then the deficit and the debt are growing faster than nominal GDP, which means all of the growth is debt. Because if you didn't grow the debt, there would be no nominal GDP. So uh, it's amazing also that this level of negative 4.7% deficit is the same as the nadir of economic growth during past recessions. The reason that we got such huge debt to GDP was because we were stimulating. We had fiscal stimulus. We had tax receipts falling off and unemployment claims going up, and that creates a fiscal stimulus. Well, we, now we're doing it in supposedly an excellent economy, and yet, um, and, and yet we're going to have a recession at some point. And when you get into the recession, your eye can sort of see the red shade area goes up by about four percentage points which suggests in the next recession, all things being equal, we would expect about 10% of GDP growth in the debt, which is uh, just unheard of during peacetime sort of conditions. So I think that if we, had, if we had no Fed involvement, I think we would have much higher long-term interest rates because the deficit supply would be so enormous, it could be two, three trillion dollars of deficit supply. And we saw in the repo market in September, there was something that the market didn't like about two and a quarter percent overnight money. Even though that was the highest yield on the U.S. Treasury yield curve, it couldn't clear the market over that period because there weren't enough reserves in the system and the Fed had miscalculated. So I would think that rates would go up a lot and that would be a disaster in a recession. It would just create a spiral. So the Fed has put us on notice that they intend large-scale asset purchases. So they'll probably start doing a lot of QE, and they'll keep interest rates contained. So what we've seen over the last several years is that it takes lower and lower interest rate peaks to cause problems with the economy. The most recent one was three and a quarter tenure. That was in the fourth quarter of 2018. It was a three and a quarter tenure that basically broke the market. The stock market went to a bear market, and we haven't even gone back to the highs of 2018 in non-U.S. markets. So what's the rate that's going to break the market this time? If we, if we have a supply-driven yield increase, it's probably something south of 3 percent. So it's a strange environment because it would mean that we might see a moderate interest rate increase um, that could be supply-driven or maybe even somewhat inflation-driven or even growth-driven, who knows? but it would probably be then reversed by the Fed, and they've so much as said so. Now, one of the things that I kind of believe in for the next multiple years is that the U.S. dollar should be in a downtrend versus a basket of foreign currencies. One of the reasons I believe that is that the dollar moves in long trends, for starters. The black line is the dollar index, and this goes back to 1989, and it basically fell from 1989 until about 1995, so about six or seven years. 
and then it rose from 1995 until 2002, about seven years. And you see when it changes direction, it usually has a pretty big move. And then it had a decline over the next seven years into 2008, into 2010. And then we had an increase from 2010 or so into January of 2017, and we haven't been able to take that high out. So I think we're in the beginning of a downtrend in the dollar. Well, part of that could be because we have a huge debt problem versus the rest of the developed world, which we'll probably get to in a minute. But also, the twin deficits, the trade deficit and the budget deficit put together as a percentage of GDP, those are shown uh, in the stacked blue area. And there's a high correlation between the growth in the twin deficit and weakness in the dollar, and vice versa. You'll notice that the uh, black, dark blue area, maybe, is the budget, the trade deficit as a percent of GDP. So under Trump, the trade deficit has not improved. Uh, it's not gotten a lot worse, but it's not, not improved, and it kind of behaved the same as it did during the second four years of Obama. So not a lot of change there in spite of somewhat radically different trade and tariff policies. And of course, the budget deficit is exploding and uh, is, will continue to explode. And so those should mean a weaker dollar. When I say the U.S. is worse than uh, other developed world, I'm really talking about Europe. On here we see uh, the U.K. and Germany and France and then the Eurozone broadly. Then there's the red line, which is the U.S. We were all of similar, uh, similar uh, de deficits to GDP back in the OOs. But Germany's gotten their act together. They actually are showing a surplus. Eurozone broadly is, is less than 1%. And there we are at 4.7. So ours is noticeably worse than the others. Also, the Fed funds rate is a good indicator of the dollar. The red line is the dollar index spot. And the blue line is Fed funds rate. When the Fed is, uh, is uh, hiking rates, usually it's a strong dollar environment. When the Fed is cutting rates, it's usually a weak dollar environment. And the Fed's been cutting rates. Also, the twin deficits have an excellent record with a two-year lead. That twin deficit chart, too, previously, if we lead it by two years, it means that based upon the shape of this red line, we might expect the blue line, the dollar index, should start falling um, pretty much uh, this year. Um, there's another a broad dollar, which looks really bearish to me. This is a really bearish technical chart. This goes back. There's, it's just different weightings, and it's a broader index than the, than the previous one, which was the Dixie index. This is much less influenced by the euro than the other one that we were showing. But we actually went to a double top all the way back to the early 00s, and we got up to about 130. The top in the early 00s was, 120, uh, was 130 and change. We got up to a 131 handle last year. But we couldn't make any progress above that, and in fact, have broken back down below the old high. That's called a throwover, and it's extraordinarily bearish. And at the bottom, we show momentum of that red line. And the momentum has been, had peaked six years ago. And as we put in a new high on the broad dollar in 2019, the momentum was flagging pretty badly. This is a very bearish chart for the dollar. So this leads me to like, based on this dollar trend, and also based on valuation and based on past performance, to like some non-US invest, non investments more than you typically would. And I know a lot of people have started doing that, and they're feeling, they're feeling bad about it because they're getting ground up because the US has been outperforming. But it's actually not as bad as you think. We'll see that in a minute. One of the things else about the dollar index is the twos, tens, which uh, for now is actually coming back down. So that leads to a higher dollar. But uh, this also is a very high correlation. I won't dwell on that. The 10-year Treasury has an eerie way of following the ratio of copper to gold. The 10-year Treasury yield is in, blue, is in red. And the ratio of the price of copper to the price of gold is in blue. And particularly for the past a few years, it's, uh, the copper-gold ratio has given a really good indicator. This actually says, because copper has been collapsing and gold is up near a high, gold's the only commodity that's up this year. Um, this suggests that the 10-year Treasury should be at 150, which is a little lower than it is today. It's at, uh, it's at 159 or so, 158. But I think we're getting close to the point where a narrative is going to develop that the bond market is sending a scary signal. I mean, the 150 tenure is gonna, would start scaring people, particularly if the Fed funds rate stays at 155, because we would have, again, a classic inversion. And these... When, when you first get the inversion of the yield curve, you get a lot of noise on financial media, the whole recession signal. And then if it de-inverts an hour later, there's an all-clear signal. 
This is completely nonsensical because the, the curve gives signals that are many, many months in advance. You get an inverted curve and it's usually 18 months, at least a year, sometimes two years before the recession comes. Um, we had an inversion, now it's coming on at nine, 10 months. So we're getting, it looks like we're gonna invert again. So the yield curve is starting to send something of a worrisome signal that will probably start to get some play in financial media. It might start tomorrow uh, because uh, we, we, could, we could start to get close to that level any day. So on the, on the bottom, you can see just how weak copper has been. That probably has something to do with uh, you know, China and the coronavirus and all the stuff uh, that's probably putting some real fears. And we've seen commodity currencies really drop a lot over that time period. Another thing that's a really uncanny indicator of the 10-year Treasury yield, weirdly, is the average of year-over-year -year nominal GDP and the German 10-year Bund yield. We just discovered this several years ago, and it's been working like a charm. This goes all the way back 30 years. And you notice how, except during recessions, the blue line, this is shaded areas, the blue line and the red line are the same line. I mean, look how well it's worked for the past, uh, I don't know, call it six, seven years, six years, down in the lower right. It's just uncanny. So what is this saying today? Well, it says that the U.S. Uh, uh, should be at about 172. However, nominal GDP is probably about to fall. So we could run this another way and we'd probably say that the yield should be, um, you know, uh, uh, pretty much a little bit lower than than the 172. We're getting kind of late on the GDP figures, so nominal GDP is gonna come out very shortly, so it'll be interesting to see how this chart moves. Right now, it's a signal that the 10-year Treasury is appropriately priced, sadly, because it's such a, such a painful thing to own at 158. I'll skip that one. Um, there's a lot of narrative about uh, foreigners are attracted to our, our bonds, and that's true. But the rest of the narrative is not true. They say that they're buying it and then they're hedging it back into their own currency. No, they're not. Because if you hedged uh, the 10 year in Japan, uh, which is the red line, and or the uh, euro bond uh, into the German bond into uh, the dollar, so you're hedging the currency risk. So if you're a German insurance company, you buy the yield you get in the United States because you don't want the negative one, but then you have to hedge the currency, this is the yield you end up with. So you're vastly better off actually buying the Bund at negative 38 than buying the U.S. at negative 63 if you hedge it. So that they're hedging it is, is false because they can't do it. Is well, simply the cost of hedging? Yeah. That, 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 that's the yield. The cost of hedging is 223 basis points, right? Uh, from uh, from uh, U.S. for the euro to be hedged in, in the U.S. Yes, that's right. So what they're doing, and we have anecdotal evidence and flow evidence out of Japan and anecdotal evidence out of Europe, what they're doing is the most desperate thing, and you can't really blame them, because if you're an insurance company or a bank and you're faced with negative yields, you just can't stomach that. It's just a, a guaranteed bankruptcy. So what they're doing is they're buying U.S. bonds and not hedging which is really dangerous. One of the reasons the dollar has held up, I believe, is that buying unhedged. Because in the old days, they might have bought the bonds and then hedged it back, so no currency, no currency uh, one way or the other. Now they're buying the dollar naked, which means that when the dollar, if and when it starts to fall, it could really fall. Because nothing is more of an itchy trigger finger than an investor who bought something knowing that it was dangerous, but did it out of need. And that's what they're doing. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, Dow theory is an old theory about the U.S. stock market from Charles Dow. It's the Dow Jones Industrials are manufacturing and then the transports, or they start to be the rails, that's shipping. And if it's a really strong market, they should hit new highs together. And if it's a really bad economy, they should hit new lows together. Well, this is one of the biggest Dow theory bear signals of all time that exists in the market right now, because the red line is the industrials, which is very, you know, went to a substantial new high in 2020 versus 2018, and the transports haven't gone come up to the 2018 high of October 3rd. So a huge Dow theory bear signal here. Um, another thing that I look at for is divergences in markets. It's interesting in the United States, the low in yields was in July of 2016. The German Bund had a, hit its all-time low uh, at up to that time also on that same day, 
July 6th intraday of 2016. And then they both rose. U.S. rose a little bit more. But Germany rose all the way up to almost 75 basis points, almost. And then the yields fell into 2019. And interestingly, Germany put in a significant new low yield and the United States did not. And that's called it divergence. I almost call that the Dow theory applied to uh, international 10-year Treasury yields. And it suggests to me that if you go above the 2016 pivot of 2016 and the German Bund, you, you probably are in a period of rising interest rates. That almost happened. It almost happened a month ago. It got down to almost exactly the same level, but it couldn't break back above it. So we're going to be watching this chart pretty carefully. So this is kind of comical because the Fed keeps saying they can't get inflation to 2%. So we've got a little flyover airplane saying CPI is 2.3. Core CPI is also 2.3. Commodities have been really bad uh, over the past uh, eight, nine years. And an interesting chart, uh, if you want to be a contrarian, commodities seem to be an incredible contrarian investment because they fluctuate in value versus the Dow Jones uh, market cap by huge amounts. And it seems to, to trade in this range. This goes back to 1917. And there are times when commodity value is 10% of the Dow Jones, and then there's times where it's 90%. So out, commodities tend to underperform by 9, 9, 9x and then outperform by 9x. It, they can spend a long time at these dis depressed levels, but it is interesting that the commodity complex is basically, versus the Dow Jones, the cheapest it's been in 103 years. Um, Obviously, there's a high correlation between the dollar being strong and commodities being weak, and vice versa, commodities being weak and the dollar being strong. Another thing that you might think about is if the dollar is going to get weak and or commodities are cheap, maybe commodities would move up with the dollar going down. This was last year. It doesn't matter. Okay, so here's the, the uh, Morgan Stanley All World, which did hit a new high here in uh, 2020. It's sort of gapped down uh, based on the virus. Uh, and, uh, but it did put in a, if you want to be a super mega bull, a melt up person, you, you might convince yourself that there's a massive head and shoulders bottom there going all the way back to the beginning of 2018. If you really want to play games with your vision, you might, that's probably from a technical perspective, you wouldn't be crazy, oh, lost their thing. So anyway, we've gone to new high, but only because of the US. If you take the MSCI, uh, and just leave out the U.S. So it's the whole world other than the U.S. This is where we are. We're way below, still, the January uh, 26, 2018 high. Uh, sorry, the, the, yeah, that's right, the January 26, 2018 high. And we've crawled all the way up to kind of the breakdown point. So we'll see what happens next. This is using um, the Acqui XUS normalized. So what we're doing is we're putting it right to, we have the meat on January 26th of 2018, we're just kind of looking at what happened going into that. So for two years, from January of 16 and January of 18, they went up almost identically. They zigged and zagged together. And then we had a huge sell-off in the early part of 2018 that was, that was continued on from the non-U.S. market. And then the U.S. joined them in the fourth quarter of 2018 and almost made it all the way back down to the same decline. And then since then, the U.S. has outperformed again. So as I say, if you have moved into non-U.S. investments, you're feeling like you're losing. But I have good news. It seems like you kind of stopped losing. That black line at the bottom, when it's going up, it's the U.S. outperforming. When it's going down, it's non-U.S. outperforming the U.S. And while it's gone up a huge amount uh, over the five years on this display, uh, most of, it kind of ended in the middle of 2019. So at least, at least uh, it, it, the, the pain has been uh, lessened. And in, in emerging markets, it's even more interesting. This is just EM. Same pattern uh, as we saw in the preceding slide. Now we're just comparing the S&P to only emerging market subsector of the non-US world. You'll notice that emerging markets have actually truly stopped underperforming the United States. They've been weaker this year, but the, the actually now for several months, they've slightly outperformed. And the other thing that's interesting is in the in the, in the sell-off of the U.S. market of the fourth quarter of 2018, that big drop there, the emerging markets outperformed, which is really weird because usually when the markets go down, the high beta market, emerging markets, goes down more, and the dollar was not weak during that period. 
So I take that to be an interestingly reassuring point that maybe the tide is turning because the emerging markets have a valuation using Dr. Schiller's CAPE ratio, which were pretty big. The, the CAPE ratio of emerging markets is half that of the United States. And you might think, well, that makes sense. Emerging markets, you know, they're dicey and can't trust them. Uh, and they should always trade at a valuation discount to the United States, except one problem with that intuitive argument, it's completely untrue. There's been numerous experiences in the past 30 years that the CAPE ratio of emerging markets was higher than the CAPE ratio of the United States. So it's not always at a discount. So it's not, it's not uh, foolhardy to believe that emerging markets equities could, over the next multiple years, outperform the, uh, the S&P 500 by fully 100 percent, all things being equal. It's not crazy. In fact, it might be a base case, particularly if the dollar gets weaker. So uh, here's the emerging market ETF. It's done very badly lately. This might be a good opportunity. I mean, these, these epidemics like the SARS thing, Goldman Sachs did a good study on, you know, not the past is prologue, but when we've had other uh, pandemic scares, how long do they last and what's the effect? And the effect is they usually last about a month in, in markets and they usually lead to about a 40 basis point drop in yields that ends after about that month. And while that may not be cause and effect all the time, that is what's happened since this thing came out. So it's, it's gone on for about the right length of time based on the past. It could always get worse, it could always be different, but the yields have also dropped about the same and they end up going all the way back up. So it'll be worth watching. I, I would certainly think a lot of people are saying, I want to get out of emerging markets now. I'm worried about this virus getting worse. What's obvious is obviously priced in. So I think to be acting today on, oh, I think this virus is going to get worse, I, I think the horse is out of the barn. So you might want to wait and wait and see signs of hope relative to the containment of the virus, but I, 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 this is not the beginning. And um, well, one last thing, not surprisingly, the S&P 500 versus the um, Morgan Stanley, here's the performance. So the S&P 500 going up, so the black line going up is the S&P 500 outperforming. The red line is the, MS, is the US dollar broad index, which had, includes emerging markets. So they're obviously very highly correlated. If the dollar falls, it's almost uh, a guarantee that emerging markets would outperform. Lastly, uh, the Shanghai is, uh, I just put this on for completeness. It's we weirdly likes to go up to uh, this high level and then back off. It's strangely, it hasn't backed off uh, with this virus. Now, I, we like to follow the Korean, the, Kos the Kospi, the South Korean stock market because it's highly sensitive to exports. Almost half of the South Korean economy's GDP is exports. And so when the Kospi goes up, it usually means there's bullishness or actual evidence of strong global trade. Look what happened after Trump got elected. Just an explosion in the South Korean stock market, a 30% gain in a year. Of course, that went away once the tariffs actually got put on. But uh, now it's rallying again. So maybe some of these uh, somewhat better signs of economic surprises in some parts of the world outside the U.S. Uh, and the South Korean market are suggesting that growth, um, that export growth and trade growth maybe has bottomed out. I'm going to skip that. This is valuation. This is really, this is really telling about the starvation, I think, for yield in the world. Because what we have on here is the red line, the S&P 500 performance versus the Russell 2000. S&P 500 is large companies, it's multinational to a large extent in terms of profitability. Russell 2000 is small companies and it's highly geared to the domestic economy. It's kind of fascinating that once the tariffs were put on for real, that the S&P 500 started massively outperforming the Russell 2000. I mean, you'd think that the tariffs might be bad for international companies and not so bad for domestically oriented businesses. But the opposite happened. We went to a, a ridiculous outperformance of the S&P versus the Russell. And the blue line at the bottom is high yield spreads versus treasuries. Actually, it's the OAS, but it's close to the spread. And usually, they go together. Small caps outperforming you know, usually means you get spreads tightening. Uh, that helps the small caps. But here we've got the S&P 500 doing very, very well versus the Russell 2000. And until few, two weeks ago, the high yield spreads were going nothing but down, so it was a tremendous divergence. 
High yield has done, t uh, has done terribly in the last two weeks. It's now negative year to date. Um, uh, uh, big problem is the commodity complex. Particularly, triple C corporates are very geared to energy sector. And the spreads on the energy sector are about 900 basis points for the triple Cs. So that's, and they blew out again with oil going down $7 in the last few weeks. Also, uh, until that two week ago period, one of my least favorite investments were double B corporates because the extra yield you got was almost the all time low versus triple Bs. There's just a weird overvaluation in the double B bond market. The double B bond market, I didn't look at it uh, this week, but last week, to no defaults, the double yield high, yield high yield bond market, to no defaults, did not yield 5%, did not yield 4.5%, did not yield 4 to no defaults. These are junk bonds. Did not yield three and three quarters. Did not even yield three and a half to no defaults. It yielded less than three and a half by a little to no defaults. I mean, it seems to me that you've got to be better off in stocks than in double B junk bonds that yield to no losses 3.4. It just seems to me they have the same downside. And the double, double Bs can fall easily 30%. And there's no upside whatsoever. Also, the corporate bond market, what makes it uh, the, particularly the, the, uh, the junk bond market, it's trading at an all-time low duration almost because so much of it's trading to its call price, which is very dangerous because a high-yield market that's trading to its call price doesn't have any upside. It's going to get called once that call date comes. And if rates, rates were to rise, it's going to turn into its maturity. So. The yield spread would have to widen. You'd go out. Thank goodness the curve is flat, so at least you don't have that problem of rolling up the curve. But we were pretty negative on double B versus triple B. Now, already that trade, if you had it on, has worked because the blue line is expanding. But we think that that should expand further. So weirdly, we, we, we have not been a, we don't like taking risk. We're very uh, anti-risk oriented. That's why the double line, double line is don't cross the double line of risk. That's kind of what the logo was about. But late last year, we were advocates and acted upon selling the middle part of the corporate bond market, like double Bs, and actually downgrading and simultaneously perhaps upgrading to get away from that part of the market that seemed historically overvalued. I, I think that's still sensible, even though you've passed your best trade location point. And uh, again, incredible divergence, high yield, the junk bond ETF price. It just doesn't go up anymore. Look at the S&P 500 roaring away for the past couple of years with a huge hiccup in the middle, but you can't get any price gain on the, on the ETF. There's no gain at all, just because there's no, there's no falling rate duration. And another thing that's been happening, which is not encouraging, is the high yield upgrade downgrade ratio is now less than one. So there's more downgrades than upgrades, and there's lots of analysis that suggests that that could be a trend. So you put it all together, and there's certain risks to be avoided. I think you have overvaluation of US equities versus uh, foreign entities. I don't like European anything. I don't like European bonds. I don't like European stocks, simply because I have absolutely no belief in the ECB and the ridiculous negative interest rate policies, nor do I think they will ultimately be able to hold it together. When the next recession comes, I think the European Union fractures apart, and their banking system appears to be bankrupt. So I don't think there's any, anything good there. So I think you're better off in emerging markets. I do not recommend China, simply because I have no idea what's going on there. Um, and for the long term, and it's not a bad entry point, even though there's a million problems, I've said for years that I like India. So Indian equities for your grandchildren's college education. Uh, probably make, uh, I would say, you probably make 1,000% in the next 25 or 30 years. It's exactly the same as China, with all the same problems that China had 35 years ago, with exactly the same demographics that China was facing, a pay-to-play legal system, ridiculous regulatory, corrupt politics, you name it, it's all there, which means it can get better. <laughs> Never buy a AAA-rated corporate bond because there's only one way the rating can migrate. So buy low, sell high. Why is it so hard to do? I don't know, but it sure is, isn't it? So uh, that's what I have to talk about today. I know that uh, we have other things. I've probably gone over a little bit, but I don't know if there's any time for questions. It's really up to Gary, whatever you want to do. Yes, if we open it up for questions. Sure, if anybody has a question. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, Bernie Sanders looks like he's going to be the nominee to me. I, I have a hard time saying that. I, I, I just came to that conclusion a week ago because I kept, you go through the list and it just doesn't seem that there's anybody else. Uh, it's one of these, it's one of these war of attrition things. Joe Biden, it's, he, he's just falling like a stone at this point. He's down to 32 cents on predict it for the nomination. Bernie's at 42 and that just flipped over the weekend. Something has happened in the psyche of uh, the analysts that Bernie is now looking better. Biden has a ceiling, it appears, of high 20s in terms of polling. He's exactly where he was at one year ago. And uh, I just can't believe that anybody could watch Joe Biden in a, in a debate for two hours and actually vote for him. I just don't think it's possible. And I spoke last week to the Executive Club of Chicago's annual fixed uh, economic forecast luncheon, and there were 2,000 people there. And I've done this before, and I have a clean sweep. I'll try it here, it'll, it'll probably backfire on me. How many people in this room enthusiastically support Joe Biden, show of hands? Enthusiastically, every time, zero. Now, try this one, this is really something. How many people in this room know somebody who, ex who enthusiastically supports <laughs> Joe Biden? It's always a clean sweep. So, uh, I mean, you know, play the record player. I mean, this is ridiculous stuff. So, so I think Biden may shock and come in under 15% in Iowa. And I think Bernie will outperform. And I think if he doesn't uh, come through early, that Yang has all but said he's going to tell his guys to, and, and, and supporters um, to shift over to, to Bernie. I think Elizabeth is going to drop out pretty soon, and that, that should reinforce Bernie. But Bernie, I mean, to win the national, uh, it just seems impossible. It sounds like a, a George McGovern type of situation is going to happen. So uh, that's what I think. I think Buttigieg uh, really was su very surprising the first time you see him, right? He's this guy. He was 37, we announced, mayor of South Bend. He, had got, he won with 11,000 votes. That's been his largest vote total was 11,000. <laughs> and you think, you've you got to be kidding me. And then you see the guy talk, and he's just, he's just so glib, and he's so good on his feet. But I saw him at the, uh, the Fox Town Hall on Sunday, and I thought he was terrible. I just thought he was awful. He just, he just seemed like uh, he'd completely become un, unmoored from any any kind of specifics whatsoever. And I think he's the next puppet. I think he's the, he's the next establishment candidate. They're positioning him for four or eight years from now, and he'll probably do pretty well. He's a little bit diminutive. That's a problem. Uh, it, just, it shouldn't be, but that's the way the world works. The tallest candidate usually wins. So th then you've got Warren, who was at 52 and predicted, and is now at six. You don't recover from a drop from 52 to six. It's over. So who's left? Klobuchar? Uh, I don't think so. She's now making some progress because people, there's not many left, and people are starting to realize that Joe isn't going to be the answer. So if you're, I think, uh, supporters been going to Klobuchar. Also, Joe has, is collapsing in his support from people over 65, which is really bad news for him because he seems to be running a campaign trying to absolutely guarantee he gets no votes from anybody under the age of 55. <laughs> I mean, he's trying, it seems. So uh, I don't know. I, I, I just see Bernie is the only one left. Now, what could happen is Bloomberg could finance a moderate. I think actually that's what Bloomberg's game is, is he doesn't want Bernie, and that's why he's in the race, and doesn't want Warren, but she's out of the picture. And he'd be fine with Biden. And I think it would look weird to have Biden Bloomberg ticket because the octogenarian ticket. But I think it could be like Klobuchar and Bloomberg. You could have a brokered convention because you can see a scenario where nobody has the delegates going into the Democratic convention. And Bloomberg said last week, very telling, he said, the reason I'm spending all this money is, now he didn't say to make America a better country, he didn't say because Michael Bloomberg is such a great leader, he said to get, make sure Trump loses. That's his one goal, stated in plain English. He wants to beat Trump. He'll spend $2 billion, he'll be VP, spend $2 billion on the campaign, 
and have, uh, have, have Klobuchar on the ticket, or maybe even slow Joe. I mean, who knows? But I, I just don't th see the octogenarian ticket as being, as being very attractive. So that could happen, which would be really interesting. So I, I think the uh, election is going to be pretty wacky, particularly uh, the Democratic Convention. And in the end, without a recession, which as we grind towards November, the chance of recession is getting kind of remote unless we start seeing these indicators uh, flip in the next few months, I think you have to believe Trump's going to win. And uh, people are starting to, well, I, I said Trump was going to win before the primary season started in 2016 in the national, in the national media. So I, I think it's the same thing. I, I, think, I think Trump is, is stronger than he polls. I, I think these outside candidates, universally, and that's another reason why I think Bernie is stronger than you think. I think he's stronger than he polls. And what would happen if they cheated him out of it again? You know, Bernie's, I think Bernie's people would go berserk. I mean, he, he, they, they, they stole it from him four years ago. He would have won in a fair fight. And now if they steal it from him again, I mean, you'd have to feel sorry for him. It's kind of like the poor uh, New Orleans Saints fans. Who, they got screwed by the refs two years in a row. The first one was a non-call on pass interference, uh, defensive pass interference, and this time it was a non-call on offensive pass interference in the end zone. It's just unbelievable. Uh, they just, it just seems so unfair. But, uh, you know, National Fixed League. Uh, I'm a Bills fan. They're getting better. They're going to win a couple of years. Other questions? Yes, sir. So last time we had this sort of uh, great opportunity and commodity in the backdrop of a potentially weakening dollar yeah. and in the backdrop of, you know, kind of tapping out here, um, you had the whole diversify away from the dollar. Not sure where it went. Driven economies. And, 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 and it, which coincided with a, a, an EEM surge. So is that kind of where, that's kind of what I'm getting at? Is yeah. You see the opportunity? Yeah, I, it, but uh, again, I, I think right now, um, when you're at these extremes, you really have to have the long view. You could, you could suffer for 18 months and make no money in commodities, or now you're losing money in commodities. <laughs> But it's, it's really the long view. It's kind of like with the India thing, that, that you have to be patient. I mean, I bought, I bought gold at like $325 or something, and I think it went down to 250 And then, you know, 15 years later, it was at 1900 It's the same type of deal. So I, you really have to take the long view. When it comes to valuation-based investing, that's re, that, like these extremes, you really have to be patient and not give up on it. And so I was, like, India wasn't good last year. I think it wasn't bad. It was like 7% or something. It's not like you're going to, you know, go bankrupt on that. But it wasn't, tw it wasn't 30%. So, yeah, that, that's what I sort of think. And um, in the next recession, I think the dollar just gets killed. So uh, you, you, you don't want to be there. No, I don't think so. I, I think I think I think I think uh, I think Trump winning is exactly what the market is expecting at this point. I think that's what's in there, because it, because there's been no politically based volatility. Elizabeth Warren got to 52 on predicted, and investors were like, she has no chance. The market didn't care, right? I mean, it was too far out. I don't know, but I think Trump would gun the debt harder if he got re-election, re-elected. He would want to gun the debt even harder. Because then he'd be, he would see the goal line. You know, if I could keep this thing going, or quasi going for four more years. It's like Mayor, Mayor Villaraigosa, he, he made a deal with the public union to give them benefit increases that kicked in a couple years after his last term, his last day in the office. These politicians, unfortunately, the thing about democracy, which is a disadvantage, is they, they don't have a long view. They're short-term oriented. So one of the benefits that China has is their president is president for life. So he can, he can have a 20-year plan. A, a, a democracy that's turning over this Congress every couple of years and the, and the White House potentially every four years can't have any long view. So what you end up getting typically is trying to you know, manage to your legacy and get out 
uh, and, and to, for Trump, I, it's pretty clear that Trump, I mean, I, I, I knew this, I talked about this in, in May of 2016 extensively. I said, Trump is a massive debt guy. He loves debt. He's never paid any debt back. So he, he just, I'm very comfortable with debt. He's actually a verbatim quote. So I would just expect more and more and more debt. Uh, and that could, I mean, if it's a tractor pull. You, you, gotta, you gotta turn up the, the, the horsepower more and more and more, closer the weight gets. That, that would actually mean accelerating the debt growth. That, and that could lead to this U-turn in the bond market that I, that I sort of see. But a uh, long way to go I, I, uh, till, till the election. Um, but I, I think Trump's going to win unless there's a recession. I think it supports a lot greater than people think. I mean, Joe Biden goes to rallies, and there's like 22 people there. <laughs> and he tells them, don't vote for me. He actually, he actually did that several times this week. When, when someone confronts him, you know, you say, you say you're for climate change, but you're rebuilding pipelines. And he goes, just go vote for somebody else. And then he pokes him and grabs him. I mean, uh, Tr Trump, you know, Tr Trump goes to a rally and he gets 5,000 people in Des Moines. You know, I mean, I mean it, it's just so obvious that, that there's an enthusiasm gap that's probably unparalleled uh, b between the, uh, those two septuagenarians. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think Trump's going to win.